Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Geeta Sahagal and we are going to discuss the attitude, shall we say, the liberal state, the so-called liberal state in the West, particularly UK and in the US, that is, and it has to what would be called the right wing or the rightist Islamic right and the Hindu right, what's called the Hindu right, what we call the Hindutva right. Mm -hmm. Uh, that there is seems to be still a continuation of what would be the colonial policy that the colonial state was in bed with the Islamic right as well as the Hindu right in India as you know and their basic enemy was the liberal secular left forces in the country. Is that a continuation of the same policy when we see the protection of different kinds of right wing groups in the in the UK for instance and you had some cases regarding the charity commission and so on. Do you think that policy still continues? I think that policy continues with modifications because of course the secular left has had many victories over the years and we should never forget that. We have fought racism, we fought for uh, uh, the emancipation of women, what's called that these days called gender equality. Uh, we fought for uh, issues that are faced specifically by what we call black women, so Asian women, Afro-Caribbean women, to be recognized in Britain. So there, there are a, a level of victories that we have been able to fight and get those victories from the, from the state. But the state's own management policies, and by the state I mean institutions, various institutions, but also political parties, both of them have seen uh, minorities, just as sometimes in this country, as vote banks, of course, the labor has had much closer relationship between with uh, Afro-Caribbean and Asian minorities. But both labor and conservative and some of the smaller parties see themselves as making alliances with the most conservative forces within these minorities. And they have actively encouraged fundamentalists on all these sides, on, from various different backgrounds, and certainly Hindu and Muslim fundamentalists, by giving them their institutions charitable status, by allowing them to open schools, by allowing them a huge amount of institutional space which they needn't have allowed. And there, I think there are two reasons, well there are a number of reasons for this. One is it's a security strategy. So although uh, people talk a lot about Islamophobia and there's certainly a lot of anti-Muslim feeling but many of us prefer to use the term anti-Muslim bigotry or anti-Muslim racism because we want to distinguish the attacks on people from the right to criticize religion because many of the people who get called Islamophobes are precisely the secular left from within those same backgrounds who are criticizing their own religions. Uh, so we prefer to not use this term which is in common use because it elides these two issues but definitely recognize that there is severe anti-Muslim racism that the far right makes use of and indeed the institutions of the government and the state are institutionally involved with. But so, so in combating that, what people don't realize is that both the conservatives and Labour at various times have made alliances with the Muslim right. So the leadership of the fundamentalists is actually gaining at the same time as a vast majority of Muslims are losing from this attitude. You know, you talked about the Islamic right and the, in that sense the uh, UK states, security states alliance with these groups. We saw that in Libya and the blowback of Manchester bombing. Mm -hmm. isn't, isn't it that the, uh, the, in trying to protect these groups uh, because they were anti Gaddafi, they actually helped jihadist forces in Libya? And UK played and a not very just Libya, role. Algeria. The French had been talking about it. Algerian uh, left activists have been talking about it for years. That Algerians, uh, well, they were not able to get uh, refugee status uh, because they were fleeing from violence by so-called non-state actors, from militant groups. So they had fled uh, to various countries abroad. They were not able to get refugee status. Yet you see known jihadists including leaders of the FIS, but also people involved with the illegal uh, jihadi movements back in the 90s being protected in Britain. And we now know from diaries of coming out of people who had spied for both of them and so on and eventually gathered evidence that put some of them in jail, that MI6 was very reluctant to act against them. They basically wanted to keep an eye on them, 
but they had what, what the Islamists called a covenant of security. They actually have a term for this. They say, we have a covenant with the British state that we will obey their laws here while we create mayhem abroad. Now, those of us who are internationalists do not think this is acceptable. We don't think it is more acceptable to go and kill people in Pakistan or Somalia or Nigeria uh, or Syria or anywhere else. Uh, 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 if you keep your nose clean in Britain and run various charities and so on. But it's also an interesting issue that the UK or the, the United States and the French for that matters have, you not, have actually allied with the most reactionary sections, say in West Asia, and have mostly been against secular uh, nationalist states. What, whatever may be the, uh, shall we say, the authoritarian or the brutal nature of the states, but it's not that the Saudi Arabian state has been kind. Uh, and it's not authoritarian as we know. But the alliance of the UK and US as well as even, the, as I said, the, all the NATO powers has been much more with these countries. So that would explain the covenant of uh, security covenant that you're Indeed, talking about. Indeed, and a lot of Saudi money that has built certain mosques and put people in power in them. Uh, I did a film many years ago in the 90s, uh, which became one of the rallying films among a lot of other work done by Bangladeshi activists, uh, which led to the tribunals in Bangladesh. Now, the tribunals are legally flawed, but I think what we not, mustn't lose sight of is that they're the only legal uh, tribunal that I know of for international crimes that has really come from a mass people's movement. So whatever their flaws in execution, I think, you know, it's, it's the... The lobbying of the Islamists in, they had very expensive lawyers in Britain and in America. In America, they had to register themselves as lobbyists, so they were exposed. In Britain, there are no laws like that. But they lobbied very hard with these fancy lobbyists who said, this is a vanity project of Sheikh Hasina. She wants to get rid of her opponents. Now, of course, it may have fitted her political um, aims, and she certainly has emerged as a very authoritarian leader herself arresting people who are part of the pro-liberation forces and voices like Shahid uh, uh, Alam putting them in jail. Um, but the point is that the tribunal was holding to account people who had been involved with mass crimes uh, in 1971 and who had fought consistently in mass mobilizations and forced her to make it part of her electoral platform. That's the part that we have not to lose sight of. Now, I had actually investigated one of the men who was in, in a death squad, Chaudhry Moinuddin, responsible for what's called the killing of the intellectuals. He went round in a van with a whole bunch of other young men who were part of the student wing of the jamaat -e islami and formed the Al-Badr death squad and picked up people who were, uh, I mean, people like us, uh, academics, journalists, doctors, uh, uh, many of them not even politically engaged, but doing things like uh, promoting to go promoting Bengali literature and took them to torture centers and had them tortured and killed them just before the liberation. In fact, they knew they'd lost. In fact, the idea was to leave the Bangladesh, emerging Bangladesh state without its intellectuals. That exactly. is really the project. Exactly. Now, several of these people went abroad and got shelter in Britain. We did this film in the 90s. We presented the information to Scotland Yard. There was no political will. And there, there are laws in Britain where uh, international crimes can be prosecuted in Britain, even if they've been committed abroad, laws of universal jurisdiction. Um, there was no political will in Britain to do this prosecution. And Chaudhry Moinuddin, in fact, rose to a very senior position as looking after spiritual care in the NHS. So an institution like the National Health Service, which is a great public institution, is... Uh, it, is actually staffed by people that he's appointed. So people involved with extreme right Islamic groups as the chaplains. And the same thing is happening in the prisons. So we're talking about the institutions of the British state itself being absolutely, uh, people are being embedded in them. So on the one hand, you have a rhetoric going on about de-radicalizing people, which is a term, of course, I hate because as a leftist, I think we should yes. you know, put it in its proper context of what it means to be a radical and not apply it to the far right. Uh, but there is this security term of de-radicalization. How can you de-radicalize when the state itself, all these institutional areas are actually full of people who've been put there uh, with the blessing? of the authorities. Now, this is also the same policy when it comes to the Hindu right in uh, in uh, UK. We have 
a lot of the uh, RSS wings operating there pretending to be relatively uh, liberal, only fighting for Indian identity, but really far-right group. Hindu identity. I mean, they don't make the mistake. Of, I mean, they will, of course, call themselves Indian in the context of the prime minister's visit or something. But they're very clear. And I saw this emerging, and in fact, wrote about it uh, post Ayodhya, and which was also post the, the Rushdi affair in Britain. So post eight and nine, when the fatwa against Rushdi happened. And then you have Ayodhya in the early 90s. And you have, at that time, uh, a very clear view coming from the Hindutva group saying, they didn't say it overtly, but they're saying we're the other of the Muslims. You know, we, we are integrated, we conform and so on, but we are not getting enough space as Hindus. So they began to attack, and the Muslim right has done it as well, so it's come from every side, the attack of a, of a much more progressive, anti-colonial, anti-imperialist black identity. And they said, oh, this is all nonsense, this is not a... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of academic work done to deconstruct that because, of course, it's not an ethnic, it's a political identity. It's a clearly unashamed uh, political identity saying that we have common origins, we've had common uh, sense of dispossession, sense of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the colonial, you know, we, the slogan was, we are here because you were there, you know, anti-racist slogan. Anti-colonial, um, anti-racist. Yeah, so it was a clear political identity. It was not an ethnic identity or a religious identity. We, we, we were clear about that. And it's not always possible to make policy based on that identity in terms of if you're looking at, you know, what provision there should be. However, a lot of extremely progressive things were done with that framework. That has been whittled away uh, where you have more and more communal groups forming. But the communal groups are not just communal in the sense that they're old-fashioned um, orthodox people. You know, it's not just um, religious orthodoxy, I mean, or, or religious traditionalism, somebody who's a believer. Uh, it's not about that. You can actually trace in Britain Whereas the first generation of activists, every variety of the Communist Party was active. The, from the Pakistanis, the PPP. Uh, there were uh, Kashmiri workers associations. There were Indian workers associations, Pakistani workers associations. They had various affiliations with all the various branches of MML, etc., and Congress and uh, People's Party. I mean, the whole, every gamut level. of political yeah. views. Where, but broadly. Progressive left to and left. secular, yeah. and with either nationalist or left uh, yeah. credentials of fighting against colonial British rule. And now what is much, much more visible, you have, uh, uh, of course, there's a huge Deobandi presence, which is, a, uh, you know, in, in the institutional presence. Then there's the Muslim Brotherhood, which has been allied with the left, the SWP and the anti-war movement. Then there's the Jamaat-e-Islami. The Muslim Brotherhood and the Jamaat-e-Islami were allied with each other, right, because they're brother organizations. But one was in bed with Tony Blair uh, and delivering uh, within, you know, the government. And the other was with the SWP. So they had everything stitched up. And those of us who were saying, a pox on all your houses, we are also marching in the anti-war movement, but we don't believe in either of these but sides. How did it <laughs> affect the... So you were talking about the Hindu right so over there. So the Hindu right has, has also played both, uh, many of these cards, and they've played it, uh, in a sense, even better, because there's not a security threat connected to them in Britain, right? So they, again, are the other of the security threat. They're the good immigrant and the, the, the ones who've uh, come in. And there has been propaganda produced, particularly by the Tories. I've not seen it uh, on Labour, although Labour has very strong links with them as well. But the Tories for the mayor's election, uh, for their Tory candidate, Zach Goldsmith, and also for David Cameron's election, have produced election material, which I think they use this sort of Cambridge Analytica style of slicing up the electorate. So in the same household, if you get two different names, they was they were trying to appeal to Hindus, but not only as Hindus, but as Tamils or, or Sikhs. Um, you know, the, 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 they said the Prime Minister's visit to the Golden Temple, to somebody else they said Labour's taken away or jewellery. They were trying to really f sectionalize and communalize the electorate and appeal to each one on that basis. And Cameron had a video called Neela Haya Kash, uh, with a sort of boppy, you know, Bollywoody type song, which had a lot of images 
and it showed how they've, the Tories have adopted multiculturalism because uh, Samantha Cameron was in a sari, Cameron was in garlands and tikas and things, and they're bowing between before various godmen. They're showing them in front of the Golden Temple. There's not a single Muslim image in any of that. So it's a clearly communal uh, way. I mean, they, you know, they're taking over Labour's policies of saying, look how nice we are, how we go to all these different religious institutions. So, so they did that. They also have strong institutional links with the Hindutva groups in Britain. So does Labour, but they, of course, flow with power. So they're um, you know, very keen on having strong conservative party links. And the main thing that they've done has derailed, they have successfully derailed efforts to get caste classified as a form of discrimination, which is prohibited in Britain. So like racism is prohibited as a form of discrimination, uh, there's been a long battle to get caste uh, accepted as a form of discrimination that, that is alive and well in Britain, unfortunately. And first they refuse to accept that there is such a form of discrimination that it happens. Then they said, anyway, we'll deal with it internally. Then I actually went and I heard a, a spokesman of one of the uh, Hindu forum groups talking, and he was talking at length and passionately about cultural genocide. This is cultural genocide. This is what they're doing. And he was attacking the Christian bishop. And eventually, I worked out that he's talking about this, this uh, proposed legislation on caste discrimination, that he was calling it a form of genocide against Hindus. If we don't keep caste we, alive, it's cultural genocide. Exactly, exactly. So you can imagine that actually the discussions on caste are like generations ago in Britain. And what the government has said is, uh, because of course they can't say we're pro-caste. So I mean, they can't say that. So what they've said is we are, um, we are going to uh, allow, if you want to bring cases on a case by case basis, then uh, this can come through case law. But we're not going to legislate right now. So the category as such is not going to be uh, made. That yes, this is which makes everybody, I mean, you know, I know people who are trying to prepare cases. And say, they're saying it's not that we can't fight, but it's, it's just raised the bar. It made the fight much harder. It's going to be, uh, legal aid has been cut, so it's much harder to, you know, even launch uh, a case. If Britain had a world goal, uh, world standard legal aid much better than the American public defender system. Uh, I mean, Britain had a state that worked much better for the people, the, the National Health Service, the legal aid system. It had accessible systems, and they have been viciously cut and whittled down. So it's, it's made the bar higher and the fight harder. Its fight is not going to end, but it's going to be much, much harder. And that is a deliberate act of the British, the conservative government. You said another very interesting uh, issue. You said the traditionalists were conservative. The traditionalist Hindu lobbies were conservative lobbies. But this is different. And I would like to come back to it. That What are the differences really? It's identity rather than about traditions. So it's yeah. more the Hindu identity. And therefore... A Hindutva identity. identity. Hindutva Hindu and Hindu, but this aggressively... Hindutva form of Hinduism, which is promoting Modi, promoting him yeah. as you our know, leader. I, I would like to you say know. Hindutva has always been Hindu identity politics. Yes. In that sense, you know. Hindu as an identity, not as a belief system. It don't, as an identity, can, but also among, about a new set of things, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you see the difference is... The Ram Janmabhumi movement you see, the and difference so is a traditionalist would be saying, I believe in religion. The Hindu identity is what Savarkar says. I yeah. don't believe in Hinduism. I, as a religion. For me, it's about identity, really. That's what he was really talking about. And, and he was an atheist. And, and they're, they're, um, they're taught that. I mean, there are shakas in Britain. Uh, you know, people attend uh, courses. They go on courses. They're trained in this. And so, for instance, they're trained. Uh, I mean, I was involved with a, an undercover film that looked into a number of charities promoting hate, uh, a different so far-right uh, uh, sort of pro-jihadi. And an HSS uh, branch was investigated, and they, they were showing these young kids footage again and again, a BBC film about Godse and the killing of Gandhi. And they're saying it's wrong to call him a Hindu fanatic. So on the one hand, they're claiming this oppression that we are being collectively damned stigmatized. because yeah, stigmatized because he's been called a Hindu fanatic. On the other hand, when asked why he killed Gandhi, they, they, they're really producing a sort of justification while trying to appear not. So there's a 
clear training going on where they're told that every time you hear the word Hindu fanatic, you must challenge it. You cannot call it. And yet he's a proud member of the fold still. So they're getting this double training and these are young uh, children, teenagers, you know, and it's, it's uh, frightening. And of course, they're, you know, told that, um, you know, we have to contain Muslims, Muslim, and, and young men are coming out with this. I mean, like children still uh, saying, oh, uh, you know, there are too many of them. So very similar to the kind of the set of myths, you know, there's too much population growth, there's, uh, you know, they're spreading everywhere, you know, there's this sort of fear factor, and uh, they have to be contained, of course, not in concentration camps, as one of these young men, but, uh, you know, we have to somehow deal with them. Um, so, it's, a, it's the same kinds of stories that are being told here are spreading in Britain, where, when I first went to Britain 30 odd years ago, uh, you know, and in fact, indeed, in the women's movement and so on, where, where I, you know, I still work, the, the organizations were secular. In fact, it was a huge chance where, where people from, uh, well, particularly with common languages, so the North Indian Pakistani women were, were always meeting. They're always together. They do things together. They work together. Well, you know, that's also the other interesting part. If you take the earlier generation of immigrants from India, a lot of them really were working class. And that's why they, you know, the Indian... Uh, working class, uh, Indian Workmen's Association, and so on. And therefore, they tended to gravitate to the left. But a lot of the middle class migration has taken place, which is really doctors, uh, engineers. Uh, this lot has been relatively, uh, relatively more right wing. Uh, in I think terms it's of diff a little different from America. I think there was a lot of state employment of whoever you were, whether you were middle class or not. So people were in the public sector, you know, they were, so even the middle classes, uh, I mean, now, of course, there are lots of businessmen and entrepreneurs, some people who often started with nothing and became uh, very successful as independent entrepreneurs or shopkeepers or something. Uh, but they moved out of shopkeeping in one generation. But there's also a large area of um, public sector employees. So uh, doctors, um, nurses, teachers, lecturers, council employees. This is the backbone of the left in Britain. I mean, they're the labor voters. So they've been that. Uh, but you do see a new class, both of the Hindu right and the Muslim right. So it's not just a ghettoized group. These are people who are well established. So for instance, you see corporate lawyers who are sort of defending these Sharia councils or courts that are tolerated and that are issuing basically worthless pieces of paper but claiming they're a judicial piece of paper that's a divorce, uh, uh, a so-called Muslim divorce. So these are working all the time and you see people very much working in the city who are promoting this kind of stuff for the Muslim right. And then the Hindu right hasn't concentrated so much on separate law, although if this allows goes on expanding, they will say, me too, and say, we want it also, you know? <laughs> yeah, but exactly. But um, uh, the, they are now embedded also in many, I mean, I, I gave a lecture on Hindutva recently uh, for the National Secular Society, and I was challenged by some uh, Hindutva activists, one of whom was a doctor, uh, and uh, who was defending the um, banning of Ramanujan's book and saying there's only one version of the, uh, of the um, Ramayan and so on. Uh, I mean, he was in a British audience that understood that he was talking about censorship, even if they didn't understand the details of what the book was and so on. They completely got that he was basically talking about censoring a text that was at the university and they weren't very sympathetic. But, you know, he was talking about his hurt feelings and his sentiment and so forth. Yeah, yeah, the so, sentiments tend to get hurt very easily. And this is a, a professional not, who's yeah. extremely protected in the system, has risen in the system, has done extremely well. Yeah, it doesn't get and, hurt uh, yeah. in when all kinds of other things happen, including, yeah. as you said, caste discrimination, discrimination against women and so on. Then he said, this guy, this, these sentiments are very, very uh, robust. They don't get hurt. But if any of these things happen, on which there is a challenge to specific construction of Hindu, Hindu identity, then of course the sentiments get hurt very easily. Gita, look forward to your writing and being with us uh, in other occasions when you are visiting Delhi. And we hoped that, you know, you're going to write more 
for news click as well as for the cultural forum and such allied, allied organizations. Look forward to seeing you. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you. This is all the time we have for news click. Do keep watching news click and do visit our website and our YouTube channel.